Louis Lumiere, the inventor of the first motion picture camera, sent a crew to Russia on a special commission to shoot a solemn event in 1896. Midday on May the 14th at the Kremlin in Moscow, the coronation of the Russian Emperor Nicholas II. During the Soviet period, he would have been described as a tyrant and an oppressor of the working class. Many people in Russia have different opinions on the country's last emperor. In certain quarters, he's considered to be a model statesman and even a martyr. However, it's also believed he was a faceless politician who ruined his country. He's referred to as Nicholas the Slaughterer and the Tsar Martyr. But who really was Nicholas II, the last Russian emperor? Dmitry Shmarin is a realist painter. He lives in Moscow and studies the life and times of the last Russian emperor. Nicholas II is a constant source of inspiration for the artist. During the Soviet period, when Dmitry was at art school, he read a book on Nicholas II and his family. I have no doubts Russia will one day restore the monarchy and have a Russian Tsar again. It'll happen, by all means. If it happens in another Russia, with other boundaries, it is a different story. But prophets once said, following the uprising of 1917, after the bloodshed, destruction and decay under communist rulers, Russia will have an orthodox monarchy once again. Dmitry is a descendant of the Don Cossacks. His ancestors served with the Royal Guard. Some of his close relatives were monarchists, but they had to keep their silence during the Soviet era. Dmitry is now happy to openly express his opinions. His first large-scale painting was devoted to the royal family. He then created a series of paintings entitled The Life of Nicholas II. He's now working on a new canvas. It's dedicated to the history of the Romanovs. How could such bright, pure and beautiful people have fallen victim to the blackguard, possessed with a raving hatred? It's totally illogical and senseless. A ball is being held in central Moscow. It's like a scene from the early 20th century. The waltz, the mazur and the polonaise. Courteous gentlemen ask ladies in crinolines for the pleasure of a dance. The Russian gentry is together once again. These people are preserving the family names which were once famous across Russia. During the Russian Empire, noble families formed a special union called the Gentry Assembly. Descendants of Russian princes, counts and barons are now restoring the traditions of their forefathers. While the young generation perfects their dance steps, the elder members of the Gentry Assembly discuss their country's destiny in an adjoining room. They share the same point of view on what policy should be pursued. There's no doubt nobility cannot exist without a source of honor, without being under the aegis of the Russian imperial house. Therefore, there's always a demand for an external source of honor to create the foundation for the assembly's activity. Russian historian Sergei Simonov has been carrying out research on the rule of Nicholas II for many years. He's got an extensive collection of memorabilia from that era. It's evidence of the glory and the might of the Russian monarchy. But there's another object, which is a reminder of a great tragedy that marked the rule of the last emperor. Hadinka Field. It's close to central Moscow. Thousands gathered here to celebrate the coronation of the emperor. It was all very badly organized. People died in a stampede, vying for the right to get a special mug with Nicholas's monogram. People were given a mug, gingerbread, a drink, and something else. Nine years later, a similar incident happened in St. Petersburg. On January the 9th, 1905, thousands of demonstrators took to the streets in the empire's capital. 
Incited by provocateurs, they clashed with police. Soldiers opened fire, killing hundreds of people. It went down in history as Bloody Sunday. Imperator Nikolai II, uh, on the Nicholas II didn't give a personal command to fire at the workers heading to the Winter Palace on January the 9th. But at the same time, he didn't stop those who gave the orders to disperse the crowd to shoot at the people. Bloody Sunday sparked a wave of violence across the country. Russian socialists tried to stage a revolution. To avoid a national disaster, Nicholas II started a program of reforms. The Tsar ushered in civil rights and freedoms and sanctioned the election of the first parliament, known as the State Duma. This move helped to create political balance and economic growth. Industry developed at a fast pace, as well as agriculture and trade. Today, Russian historians often criticize Nicholas II in his role as a statesman. It's hard for me to say this, but going on general accounts, he wasn't much of a ruler, to put it mildly. He lived in a time when only a powerful personality like Peter the Great could lead the nation and control the situation. Whereas Nicholas was born, as the poem goes, for a peaceful life, for the country's silence. This monument was erected in the settlement of Tyninskoye in the Moscow region in 1996, on the 100th anniversary of the last emperor's coronation. Hundreds of people from across Russia gather here every year to pay their respect to the Tsar. Russian monarchists are convinced that the nation made a serious mistake at the beginning of the 20th century by killing the Tsar. Not only the killers are to blame for the blood of the Tsar and his family. Every human being is responsible for this, the whole of the Russian nation. We're guilty because our ancestors did not help, did not rise against it, didn't utter a word of protest. Nicholas II was the eldest son of the Emperor Alexander III. He was born in St. Petersburg on May 18, 1868. Children from the royal family were given a good education at home. Nicholas spoke three foreign languages, English, French and German. Dynastic marriages are usually marriages of convenience. It so happened, this time Nicholas II's marriage was a happy one. He loved his wife. In keeping with the royal tradition, Nicholas II was obliged to marry a woman with a royal background. Nicholas chose the princess of hessen darmstadt who came from German nobility. The princess, whose first name was Elisa, converted to Orthodox Christianity and adopted the name of Alexandra. Nicholas, like his forefathers, was not indigenous to Russia. The Romanov family was closer to the German, Danish and British royal families. Nicholas was Queen Victoria's great-nephew, and King George V was his cousin. They were like two sides of the same coin. They sported similar beards and were the same height. They swapped their clothes and no one could tell who was the Russian emperor and who was the British king. They joked a lot. But mortal danger dogged the last Russian emperor from an early age. When Nicholas was 12, revolutionaries from an underground socialist organization killed his grandfather, Emperor Alexander II. An era of political terror evolved in Russia under the rule of Nicholas II. Revolutionary socialists and terrorists hunted down the last emperor. Two Russian interior ministers the chief prosecutor, the chief of police, and the governor of St. Petersburg died at the hands of terrorists. In 1905, an uncle of Nicholas II and another member of the royal family 
the Moscow general governor, Grand Prince Sergei Romanov, were killed in 1905. A revolutionary assassinated the Russian Prime Minister, Pyotr Stolypin, in 1911. However, neither the Tsar nor his family were attacked during his reign. The last Russian emperor was an exemplary family man. Nicholas and Alexandra had five children, four daughters named Olga, Tatiana, Maria, Anastasia, and a son, Alexei. The heir to the throne was a hemophiliac, which meant his blood failed to clot. It's a rare condition, and a minor injury could have killed him. He was under the constant supervision of tutors and doctors. This hindered Nicholas II during the last 12 years of his reign. The demonic figure of Grigory Rasputin emerged solely due to the heir's illness. His role in the royal family still isn't clear to this day. Rasputin's influence on the crown prince was like a sedative. He, as many people at the time, believed he could cast a spell on his blood. Besides, Rasputin possessed some of the same qualities as a psychotherapist, if we speak in modern terms, and this explains his influence. Many modern-day admirers of Nicholas II visit this church at a remote cemetery in Moscow. It's the only church in the capital named after Tsar Nicholas II. Its father superior, Mikhail Ardov, studied the history of the house of Romanov. Judging from the monarch's memoirs, the last emperor considered going into the church. He was a profound believer in God. His family was the church at home. His attitude to the church was very serious. He glorified many saints. Nicholas II and his family were canonized in the 20th century as martyrs who died for their faith. Mikhail Ardov's church has many icons depicting the royal family. But there's one icon which the priest praises above all. Its meaning is the Tsar takes off his crown and a martyr's crown appears on his head. His abdication was a Christian and a sensible act. The Russian-Japanese War of 1904 to 1905 was a trial for Nicholas II. The Russian Empire was defeated. It lost most of its navy and vast territory in the Russian Far East. The First World War broke out in Europe in 1914. Russia was one of the first countries to join as part of the Entente, a strategic alliance forged with Britain and France. But the first months of the war revealed that the Russian army was considerably weaker than the enemies, namely Germany and Austria-Hungary. Their armed forces were superior in terms of weapons, equipment and technical skills. The Tsar took personal control of the Russian army and he often visited the front. But there were a series of military failures on all of the fronts, and the number of casualties continued to rise. In the long run, the fact he was a patriot, a brave and loving man, and in many ways a decent person, turned out to be historically insignificant. The First World War seriously affected the Russian Empire's economy. The country faced chronic food shortages. Strikes and protests began on the home front. A bourgeois revolution occurred in Russia on February the 27th, 1917. The monarchy was overthrown and the country was declared a republic. Nicholas II abdicated in favor of his brother Mikhail three days later on his way back from the front. But Mikhail also abdicated just hours after Nicholas signed the manifesto. The Russian monarchy was legally abolished. The war was ongoing. He was the commander-in-chief. It's a right which carries huge responsibility. 
And in this capacity, the sovereign abdicates, he leaves the army and the country to the mercy of fate. Nicholas II and his family spent the last months of their lives under arrest. A socialist revolution led by Vladimir Lenin brought the Bolsheviks to power in Russia in November of 1917. Soviet rule was established in the country. And from that moment on, the Russian emperor and his family became political prisoners. They were incarcerated in a small private mansion in the town of Yekaterinburg in the Urals. An armed convoy watched their every step. This is how the Russian film director Karen Shakhnazarov portrayed the last Russian emperor's final days. He planned to screen the tragic story during the Soviet era, but decided to realize his project in 1991, a time of huge political change in Russia. The film didn't aim to restore Nicholas II or judge the Bolsheviks because there is no right and wrong in a revolution. But some political groups perceived it very differently. Karen Shachnazarov's film is called Regicide, which means the killing of a king. The famous actor Malcolm McDowell played the lead role. McDowell plays Bolshevik Yakov Yurovsky who is believed to have killed Nicholas II and his son, the Crown Prince Alexei. It was the first time that the story of the execution of the royal family had been adapted to the big screen. It was the night of July 16th, 1918. Everything happened behind closed doors. The Tsar and his family were executed without a trial, a decision made by Soviet executive organizations. The Romanovs weren't actually put to death by official executioners. Instead, they were shot by a selected group of people. I believe it's one of the most dramatic episodes in world history. But far from everything has been said and written about it. This event is as important as the executions of Mary Stuart or Louis the Sixteenth. These themes will always stir artists. In 1994, when the political climate in Russia was undergoing dramatic changes, Nine skeletons were discovered in a mass grave close to Yekaterinburg. DNA testing, which was 99% accurate, revealed that the bones belonged to members of the Romano family. In 1998, a state funeral was held for the last emperor, Nicholas II, at the Cathedral of St. Peter and Paul in St. Petersburg, in the famous Romanov crypt. A workshop near Moscow, which produces large religious icons. It belongs to the Russian Orthodox Church and makes plaques and icons on a large scale. Yelena Yeliseva painted the first icon of Nicholas II and his family. It was a very difficult commission. The only things I had to work with were photographs. I already had the photographs because I worship the royal martyrs. Yelena's icon has been copied many times for cathedrals across Russia. The Novotichvinsky Monastery in the Urals also produced a series of icons of the Russian royal family. When the Romanos were being held in Yekaterinburg, nuns from the monastery gave them food, and they may have been the last people to see them alive. People ask us to paint icons of the royal family. Our monastery is in the Urals. Many people only want nuns to paint the icons, because they are in the place where the family was shot. The nuns who helped the Romano family have all died by now. The artists who produced the icons cast molds from sculptured busts of the Tsar and his family. It's the most effective way to achieve a true likeness. The workshop's reputation has spread far and wide. The nuns even receive orders on the internet, both from Russia and abroad. 
The last commission was from the United States, and it's a joy for the nuns to carry out this work. To them, Nicholas II and his family are saints. Nicholas did not perform miracles. He did not bring anybody back to life. He was a man of his time. He fought with dignity, and he accepted his fate. He abdicated his crown because the fate of his homeland was more important to him than his own. He never wanted to become the ruler of one-sixth of the planet, but he had to become him. Nicholas II never had a thirst for power. He never believed that Russia would lose its orthodox monarchy. The last emperor never imagined that the state would collapse nor that his own subjects would become the executioners. He has found a place in the history books. But the question still remains, who really was Nicholas II? In part, the answer is that he was the last representative of his dynasty, the last Tsar and autocratic ruler, the last master of the Russian Empire.